the Battle of Endor left the Galactic Empire fractured and the galaxy teetering on the edge of chaos. Amid the celebrations and fireworks on Coruscant, an uprising erupted in the non-human dominated sectors. Billions struck out against the Empire, attacking Imperial patrols in the streets as they desecrated and destroyed Imperial symbols. In response, Imperial authorities ordered a massive crackdown on the rebellious citizens, authorizing the use of lethal force by the local military to end the uprising and restore order. The military retaliation was ruthless, with the death toll rising as the Empire struck down the insurrectionists and brought the populace back under its control. It would be two and a half years before the Rebel Alliance, reformed as the New Republic, arrived to liberate Imperial Center and bring freedom to Coruscant's people. Today, we look at how the New Republic seized control of Coruscant from the remnants of the Empire. As we journey through this epic struggle, we'll explore the covert operations, the fierce battles, and the relentless determination that culminated in one of the most significant victories in galactic history. The balance shifted when the second Death Star was destroyed and Emperor Palpatine died. With the destruction of the Executor and the battlecruiser Pride of Talandia, command of what was left of Death Squadron, Darth Vader's personal naval squadron, was transferred to the Chimera. But the command structure of the Chimera was in chaos, as her commander, Admiral Horst Strage, was killed during the fighting, leaving Captain Galad Pelion in charge of a large portion of the remaining Imperial forces. With the Empire's fleet in disarray, Pelion ordered a retreat to Anaj, the capital world of the Medel Sector. At a council of war, Pelion insisted the rebel military could be crushed before word of the Emperor's death spread across the galaxy. But the flag officers quarreled, eventually separating and retreating across the galaxy. This scene unfolded across the Empire. As Palpatine had never provided a succession plan, many laid claim to the empty throne or fortified their holdings, declaring themselves independent warlords. By scattering and fighting among themselves, the Imperials missed a golden opportunity as the Battle of Endor left three quarters of the Rebel fleet's capital ships needing extensive repairs. These breakaway warlords consolidated their power in the core worlds or mid-rim, believing they could better resist the Rebels on their own than fight with the fragmenting Empire. With the Empire in disarray, the Rebels, now a transitional government known as the Alliance of Free Planets, allowed these warlords to fight amongst themselves and destroy each other. Mon Mothma chose not to attack the warring Imperials, instead she believed diplomacy would do more to dismantle the Empire. Sending envoys to thousands of worlds, many systems joined the fledgling government and became the democratic union known as the New Republic. However, many others declared themselves independent, which the New Republic respected. Mon Mothma then made a move that, as Admiral Akbar later admitted, delivered more worlds to the New Republic than any dozen campaigns could have. She issued the defense declarations. This executive order stated that while member worlds of the New Republic were expected to support the New Republic Defense Force, they could also control their own planetary defense forces. This was a big deal because a thousand years before, when the Republic demilitarized during the Rusan reformations, regulations were placed on planetary security forces, specifically in regard to fleet sizes and armaments. And during the Clone Wars, the Republic nationalized PSFs, making them part of the Republic Navy to combat the separatist armies. And in order to enforce his control, Emperor Palpatine kept the PSFs as part of the Imperial military under the Galactic Empire. As word of the defense declaration spread, loyal Imperials declared this illegal. However, it became the deciding factor for many worlds to break away from the Empire. In regions where loyalties were sharply divided, battles erupted between rival Imperial factions, further weakening the Empire's ability to wage war, accelerating its fragmentation, and paving the way for the New Republic's advance. Two and a half years into the New Republic's existence, the Empire still controlled much of the galaxy. Both Mon Mothma and Admiral Akbar knew the key to ending the Galactic Civil War lay in capturing Coruscant, still known as Imperial Center. But how could a young Republic, still reeling from battles and stretched thin across the galaxy, hope to seize control from the might of the Empire? This impossible task fell to Wedge Antilles and Rogue Squadron, infiltrate Coruscant and sabotage the planetary shields. After two costly attacks, Borlias was secured as a forward base and the New Republic military began staging the operation. As Rogue Squadron infiltrated the heart of Imperial City, a controversial distraction plan was set into motion. Against the better judgment of many members of the ruling council, 16 of the galaxy's most dangerous criminals were freed from the spice mines of Kessel and released on Coruscant to incite chaos. 
As these criminals drew the Imperials' attention, the rogue's plan was to create a superstorm to knock out Coruscant's shields with extensive lightning strikes. Avoiding close calls with Imperial intelligence, they stole a construction droid and infiltrated a command building where they took control of an orbital mirror. These mirrors were designed for environmental control, but the rogues used one to focus a beam of sunlight and flash boil one of Coruscant's artificial reservoirs. The steam cloud created by a violent electrical storm and with some ace piloting by future Jedi Corrin Horn, the planet's defensive shields collapsed. With the planetary shields finally down, Admiral Akbar and the New Republic fleet wasted no time jumping into the system and the Battle of Coruscant began. They overwhelmed the Imperial Star Destroyers in orbit, clearing the way for General Bryn Tantor's ground strike force. Tantor's mission was critical, disable key Imperial command centers and sensor nodes to pave the way for a larger invasion. However, Coruscant was not easily conquered. The New Republic forces faced heavy resistance, leading to brutal building-to-building -building combat. Heavily fortified walls and relentless Imperial defenses turned every advance into a grueling struggle. Inch by inch, the New Republic soldiers fought their way forward, eventually breaching the inner defenses and drawing ever closer to the Imperial Palace. Here, what remained of the Imperial High Command made their final stand. General Han Solo then dispatched a small but elite force commanded by General Rand Taylor and accompanied by Luke Skywalker for the final assault. Supported by the Millennium Falcon and squadrons of advanced X-Wings and heavy Y-Wing Starfighters, they engaged the entrenched Stormtroopers, AT-Series Walkers, and mobile artillery units guarding the palace. Their path was further obstructed by a heavily fortified second gate, protected by advanced turrets. It wasn't until Lancer Squadron's B-Wings were called in that the New Republic's forces managed to clear a path through. The fiercest resistance awaited them at the Imperial Palace. Elite forces, including stormtroopers, bounty hunters, dark troopers, and various heavy vehicles, put up a valiant fight, but the determination and superior strategy of the New Republic forces ultimately prevailed. Overcoming the last of the Imperial Guards within the palace, the New Republic Task Force captured the Imperial Palace, marking the end of Imperial rule on Coruscant and the beginning of a new era of freedom. The New Republic's triumph in liberating Coruscant was a bittersweet one. Isain Assard, the cunning and ruthless former director of Imperial Intelligence, who had effectively become the Empress of the Empire, managed to escape in the chaos. Rising to the top of the Galactic Empire demanded meticulous preparation and foresight, and Assard was no exception. Anticipating a likely invasion by the New Republic, she devised a contingency plan that was as devastating as it was insidious. Isard commissioned the creation of the Krytos virus, a deadly bioweapon engineered to target only non-human beings. This virus ravaged the body, destroying it cell by cell until the victims disintegrated in an excruciating death. Highly contagious and curable only by large amounts of Bacta, the virus unleashed a new crisis on Coruscant in the moment of the New Republic's victory. Isard's gambit was clear inherit an infected world and let the ensuing non-human bias and chaos undermine the New Republic from within. The cost of acquiring sufficient Bacta to treat the afflicted nearly bankrupted the fledgling government. Millions of aliens perished, fueling conspiracy theories among the non-human populace and triggering intense political maneuvering within the New Republic. Despite these trials, the New Republic endured. The fall of Coruscant marked a significant turning point. The former symbol of Imperial might had now become the seat of the New Republic, a beacon of hope in a galaxy scarred by war. This legend's account of the liberation of Coruscant is a thrilling tale of strategy, sacrifice, and triumph. Yet the New Republic's battle against the remnants of the Galactic Empire was far from over. In just a few years, Palpatine would somehow return. Thank you for joining us on this journey through one of the most pivotal moments in Star Wars history. If you have any favorite moments or questions, we look forward to hearing from you in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you in our next video.